Okay. It looks like we are live. How is everyone doing today? Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. My name is Jason Levine, and for today's live stream, I am once again joined by my good friend and fellow Adobe colleague, Carl Soule, coming to us from the Adobe Santa Monica Studios. How's it going today, Carl? Hi, Jason. Doing good. How are things there? Oh, great. Coming to you live from the desert in Arizona. And uh, in the spirit of the last couple of weeks when we've been doing these things, Carl is going to take you through some really awesome uh, film and television workflows today, specifically talking about uh, working with um, Dynamic Link and After Effects and how the editors in film and television, sort of the typical workflow for collaboration and leveraging Dynamic Link between the editor and the compositor. So um, as always, of course, we've got uh, our live chats in all the various networks. So we're coming to you live on Facebook, on the Premiere Pro page, on Behance, on YouTube as well. Uh, and of course, on Twitter Periscope. So if you have questions, um, this is the place to ask. So Carl is going to kind of lead the session here. Uh, and if you've got questions, I can feed them to Carl or I will be answering them live in the chat as well. So with that, Carl, why don't you uh, tell everybody what you're going to be covering today and then I'll send it over to you. All right. Thanks, Jason. So kind of what I wanted to go into today, um, a lot of times when you see um, some of the different TV shows and the feature films that we talk about in some of our marketing literature. Um, you know, we've had a great working relationship with uh, places like uh, David Fincher's editorial team, uh, Mindhunter, All Cut in Premiere, and uh, they've actually pioneered a number of different workflows. So I thought I'd jump in and uh, talk a little bit about some of the behind the scenes stuff that goes on there. Um, I'm going to talk in somewhat broad terms. I'm allowed to tell you certain things, and there are certain things that are kind of their own secret sauce that I got to uh, keep to myself. I would love to get Tyler Nelson. If you're watching Tyler, I want you to do one of these with Jason and talk about how you do the amazing stabilization in After Effects, because uh, I know a lot of people would really appreciate that. Oh, but I yeah. uh, can't, qu can't quite show that to you today, but I am going to show you a couple of tricks in how... After Effects and Premiere work together, a lot of times we talk about this as if it's one person that's doing both the editorial work as well as using the uh, uh, using After Effects to create compositions, um, reframe shots, and so on and so forth. And in a lot of respects, um, in Hollywood, these are jobs that are broken up among a team of people. And uh, I thought I'd show you some of the best practices and tips and tricks. If you are an editor and you want to stay out of After Effects as much as possible, but you want to be able to work really, really effectively with an After Effects artist, if you're within a building and you're on shared storage or you want to prepare stuff to send off to somebody, you know, we've had some great stories about people uh, editing in LA and sending visual effects up to Northern California, you know, on a, on a drive. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways that you can work. And uh, I thought I'd just kind of dive into a little bit of the dynamic link workflow to start with, um, because this is something that's used quite a bit. Um, if you go in and you watch some of the shows by David Fincher, um, you know, this one in particular, you wouldn't realize it by looking at a lot of the shots, but in many cases, what Fincher does is he actually takes the best performances of each actor within the same scene. So oftentimes they'll say, the guy on the left, I want take five. The guy on the right, I want take 17, whatever it happened to be that day. And obviously this has to get split screened. You have to put the two shots together. Um, and then sometimes timing is something that gets played with in post-production. Maybe I want this guy to start talking over the top of the other guy. Those are the types of things that uh, you play with in After Effects. And uh, one of the editors on uh, Mindhunter, uh, Kirk Baxter, he actually kind of described this as, um, actually this was on uh, Gone Girl, which was another film used uh, that used Premiere uh, as its primary editing tool and uh, um, was also um, used this technique quite a bit. He described it as cutting a mask like with a chainsaw. In other words, he wants to spend as little time as possible setting up the split screen, just enough to see how the two actors are going to play off of each other. And then he wants to push that off to 
a uh, an After Effects compositor, somebody who uh, dives into the minutia and the detail to get everything to line up properly, to do all the cleanup, remove unwanted elements in a shot, everything associated with that. So let me show you how this actually plays out in the applications here. So diving back into Premiere Pro, what I have going on here, um, I've got a, a shot in a timeline here. I'll just play that. I'm keeping this all very, very short <laughs> uh, just for the sake of timing because some of this does require, you know, rendering out files and I don't want to waste your guys' time doing that. But you can see here I've got a shot. I'm not 100% happy with the step this guy is taking uh, while the kid is riding off on the bicycle. So what I want to try and do is I want to change the timing of this. And so I want to create a split screen comp between the two here. So basically the way to do this is to take the original clip. If I select it in the timeline and hold down option and drag up, that's going to make a duplicate version of this. And I've already done that. You can see that the name on this clip and the name on this clip are identical. Um, just to show that, uh, you know, I've, I've already gone through and done this a little bit. I'm trying to save just a bit of time in doing this, uh, get rid of some of the tedium and the boredom in, uh, in how this works. Okay, so duplicated the clip. Once I do that, I'm going to want to use the masking function inside of Premiere Pro. Now, the mask controls every effect that you use in premiere pro has its own mask controls and you have some presets for creating a four point mask and ellipse mask or you can just free draw using the bezier tool now you've seen here i've already gone through and drawn a mask in this shot i'm going to go ahead and uh, just delete this and do it again just so you can see this in action so what i'm going to do select this clip I'm going to select the pen tool for the opacity function. And I'm going to come over here to my program monitor. Let's get that centered here on your screen. And I'm just going to quickly click, 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 click. And by doing this, I've now masked off this upper layer in my timeline. So if I turn off the bottom layer, you can see what we're getting is uh, we're getting just the area inside the mask. So I can now use the shot of the man on video two and the shot of the kid on video one, and I can start to play. I can start to go in and kind of look at the timing and, you know, it can be what I'm talking about here is kind of subtle, but, uh, you know, it can be a performance between two people. You can speed up a shot a little bit. Uh, maybe if somebody just holds a pose for a moment, you can use that to kind of cut and trim out a section um, and kind of move them up in time so that when they start talking, it's kind of over the top of another person. Um, there's a lot that you can do to play around with just the overall composition of shots. Um, you know, obviously not everybody goes to, uh, you know, these levels of detail, but this is kind of a classic thing that we see uh, when we talk about, you know, Hollywood film and television getting the exact emotional feel out of a shot. So what I've done from here is I've used the slip tool on this top layer to actually slip the performance a little bit in time. So we're closer to the end of the shot. Oh, Carl, you might want to switch back to your screen. Oh, <laughs> thank you, yeah, Jason. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, so what I've done is use the slip tool here and the slip tool enables me to actually move, keep this shot in the same duration, but move to some of frames that are currently off camera. So I want to get the reaction, the big smile at the end where the kid is off camera but I want to move that in so it's in the same frame um, as the kid moving away. So now I've done this. I've got a shot where, you know, the you can see that the guy has moved significantly in the shot. Um, he's now much closer. He's kind of looking off in the distance. And uh, 
when I hit play, you can see the shot. You can see it's not 100% perfect. In fact, I can see where the road and the line right about, let's move that in the center here. You can kind of see the edge of this. So at this point, I'm not worrying about it being perfect. As Kirk said, uh, make it like a, uh, you know, cutting it with a chainsaw, just getting the performances roughly where we want in the frame. And then we're gonna push that over the fence to the After Effects artist to smooth these things out, make it, make it look perfect. Okay, cutting back to my, my computer here. So now at this point, I'm ready to send this all over to After Effects. And what I'm gonna do is select both shots, right click, and the menu choice I'm gonna wanna make is something called replace with After Effects composition. So by choosing this, it's gonna package up both of the clips that I have selected. It's gonna to toss them over the wall to After Effects, put them both into a new composition. But the cool thing, of course, is the mask that I've created in Premiere now becomes an After Effects mask. So the After Effects artist takes advantage of the rough shot or the rough mask that I've done. They could delete it and start over if they want, but oftentimes you can just go in and use things like the per vertex feathering um, that After Effects offers on mask controls. The mask controls in After Effects uh, expose a lot more capability, a lot more fine tuning than we have here in Premiere. Premiere is designed to be quick and fast. After Effects is all about the detail. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this. Now After Effects will launch and uh, if I didn't have After Effects open already, it'll ask me to create a new composition but what this has gone through and done, it's imported the shot for me, it's imported the clip for me, and most importantly, the entire work that I did over in After or in Premiere has now moved over into After Effects. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and show you the Per Vertex feathering tool, because this is a, it's a mask feathering tool is the official name of it. I call it Per Vertex because you can actually adjust in between any of the points of the mask, you can change how the feathering operates. So if I needed to lower the feathering down by his shoe and raise it where the road meets to get that to blend a little bit better, I can use this, this function directly on the mask to, in this case, I'll just click on the, uh, on the mask here and I could move the feathering around, maybe lower it at this point, but right here, I want a little bit more feathering. And right here, I want even more feathering to help to start to blend in the road a bit and make that look better. So you can see I'm doing really, really detailed work on the feather function, bringing that in inward towards the, uh, towards the, the guy in the shot. Um, and I can really sculpt that out. Now that's really subtle. Um, if I were to switch back over to Premiere Pro, you might be able to see the difference or the change here. Just so you guys can really see this, I'm gonna go ahead and just do some crazy stuff on the composition in After Effects, just to kind of give you a sense of what's going on here. So let's say we wanna also do some color on this. I'm gonna go ahead and add a, uh, in fact, let me do this with an adjustment layer. I'm very quickly going to add a, a new layer to my comp. There we go. New adjustment layer. I'm going to throw a Lumetri color effect on that. Yep. Oh, and let's go back to your screen again, Carl. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Um, for whatever reason, I'm having trouble. Uh, After Effects <laughs> kind of does that to me, I think, when I start getting into this. I start you get in the zone. It. It's hard to remember where you're at. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. That's what I'm here for. So uh, I've gone ahead and given this like a big change here. Here's a, a large color effect I've adjusted. I've just thrown a LUT on it over here in, in uh, After Effects. If I switch back to Premiere, you can see that get applied in my, uh, my program monitor. Now, here's where we start to diverge. Um, I'm doing this solo on my laptop. If another After Effects artist wants to pick up and work on this, 
literally all I would do as an editor, right click, create a, an After Effects composition with this, save the After Effects project, make sure it's saved on the network wherever my After Effects artist can grab it, and close After Effects. Don't need to work in After Effects at all. As an editor, I want to stay away from that. So the only thing I have to do is see it, save it, close it, done, I'm out. Um, in Premiere, if I want to continue to edit with this um, and I want to get good performance, what I do is come down here, right click on this and choose render and replace. Now by doing this, I can pick a format that matches uh, the, the format that I want to be uh, saving to. And this is just going to be a temporary file anyway. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and click OK on this and let this go through and just quickly do a, uh, a render of the clip. And now if I zoom in on this and we look at the name of this, you'll see that this is actually showing it's rendered.mov at the end. Uh, so now we have effectively severed the dynamic link. We basically said, okay, you know, this was a dynamic link. We kind of saw it, made sure it looked okay in After Effects. And now I'm gonna let the After Effects artist go off and do some additional work on it. I can continue to play my timeline. Everything is smooth. It's just playing a ProRes file. It's not linking back to the After Effects file. It's not constantly going back and looking for changes to the After Effects file. So if I have to do any test screenings or anything else at this point, I'm free and clear to you know, export this out, render a file, and I don't have to worry that it's been pulled apart and getting put back together again over inside of After Effects. Now, I'm gonna continue to make some changes over in After Effects just to uh, continue to clean this up a little bit. I can see that uh, there's a little bit more work that I wanna do with the mask on this. So we're gonna go ahead and select the mask and I'll just grab my pen tool again so that I can grab some of these points and I'm just gonna pull this point out a little bit further. It's getting a little bleed through around his head there. And I tell you what, on the, the color adjustment on this, I am going to change this very, very dramatically at this point. Let's go from this blue look to something even more. Ooh, I like that. That kind of looks like a sunset. It looks like maybe there's some rain clouds in the future. Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and throw my very favorite effect, my ultimate favorite effect in After Effects, a rain adjuster. And we'll put that on the adjustment layer as well so that it goes through both layers. And I'll go ahead and make it look like it's raining. So now we're starting to get this to where we want it. Um, if I go back over to Premiere, you'll see there is no rain. There hasn't been a color shift. The modifications haven't been changed over in Premiere at this point. But now the After Effects artist has come back to editorial and says, you know, okay, I think I've got it dialed in. Why don't you take a look, see how it looks in context in, in the edit. Okay, all I need to do at that point is right click on this, say restore unrendered, which is right here. And you'll, you can already see it in the background. The moment that I restore the unrendered version, it will instantly link back to the After Effects composition. Um, and I'll immediately go back to seeing a live uh, view of what's going on inside of After Effects. So at this point, typically, you know, we will see how the composition looks in context of the edit, how it looks with the clips before, how it looks with the clips after. Um, if everybody is happy with it and it gets signed off on, great. Um, we can render and replace it here in the, in the timeline. Uh, the After Effects artist can go start working on a higher res version of this for the final deliverables for the film, and, uh, and, and we're good to go. If we need to do another round of this, that's perfectly fine because we can do that render and replace as many times as necessary to, again, just kind of temporarily lock it down um, so that we can you know, continue to work and treat it just as a, uh, you know, a ProRes video clip um, and then come back to it at another point in time. So that's kind of what I wanted to show on, uh, on this front. Um, 
there's a couple of other things I kind of wanted to talk about. I think we still have a bit of time, Jason. You mind? Yeah, yeah. And in fact, Carl, I was just going to say maybe we could just elaborate a little bit more because that new, uh, the new render and replace and restore on render. That's that's something that we added uh, just about a year ago, right? That came out last April at NAB, mm-hmm. and uh, there were some questions about. Can that only be used with at, with dynamic links, or can that be used just to render effects and then restore them after the fact in a regular timeline in Premiere? And of course, the answer is yes. You don't need a dynamic link yes. to make that work. Yeah. Yeah. What's interesting about this is this was added originally. Going back even further, it was added specifically for dynamic links. Um, what we did last year is we kind of opened up this concept so that if you're ever in a situation where you need to kind of bake down some footage and you're worried about handing clips off from person to person. Uh, one challenge that we see in a multi-user environment is if you render your timeline where you get the green bar, if you haven't set up the render, uh, the scratch disk locations to something that can be shared in a local area, um, the other person opens up your project and those render files are no longer there. They're not there. Um, <laughs> so. That, that can be a problem. So this render and replace can be used just in Premiere if you have like a heavy effect stack or you're dealing yep. with a motion graphic template that you know is exceptionally heavy or anything along those lines, you can always think about using render and replace as a way of quickly kind of baking that media down. Um, you can actually, when you do it to just a clip, you can open up the effect controls and see that right. it'll show you the, it'll still show you the effects, but the controls will be grayed out and it'll have the word rendered next to them. So that's definitely a, a, another use for render and replace. Um, but what's, what's interesting is this render and replace function actually came from our engagement with Fincher uh, back during the days of shooting and, and editing Gone Girl. And uh, they specifically wanted to have this function so that you know they could really take advantage of the power of dynamic link, but at the same time, be able to kind of temporarily cut and sever the, uh, the connection um, so that editorial could continue and it would just work just like any other video clip. Right. So, and, um, and I think, I think what's really cool and it's the point you just made is that when, when you do do the, the sort of render free, freeze it up with all the effects and things baked in, you still see the evidence of that effect in the effects controls, which again, you didn't see yes. previous. And that, that's huge because you always have the ability to unrender it, restore the unrendered and then have access to all those original parameters, which is, uh, pretty amazing, especially if you're doing a lot of cutting. I mean, this is, of course, we're talking about TV and film Hollywood, but for many of us who are cutting on laptops in general, it's a great way to get your playback in real time at you know half or full res, and then always have that ability to make it editable after the fact, which is wonderful. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, speaking of of Hollywood, I had a little, uh, just a little kind of an Easter egg for you guys. Um, I did a presentation uh, in. Uh, one of the guilds, and I got special permission to show just a, a quick screenshot of all the different cameras and the different raster sizes uh, that were used in the making of uh, Terminator Dark Fate. So uh, let me quickly just bring this up here so that you can see this. I can zoom in a little bit if it, the text is a little bit difficult to read, but basically, you know, the film use a wide range of different camera formats and different raster sizes that it was shot in. And uh, this was is one of the challenges that we typically face today as well in Hollywood. Um, you know, very famously, we talk about uh, Fincher shooting in 6K for a 5K framing, and then they deliver in 4K. Um, you know, with a film like Terminator, you know, if you saw that chart, the hero camera uh, was was around 8K in size, but they had everything in there from 8K to standard def drone footage and a wide range of different sizes and shapes and aspect ratios to work with. Um, so one of the, th- the key things that we see a lot in Hollywood is they will process all their footage into a specific size. Um, so and they'll burn in like letterboxing or pillar boxing, just so all the clips kind of behave the way you would expect it. Um, the other method of working is they'll they'll figure out, and this is where you gotta go back to your, your elementary school math. If you remember the phrase least common denominator, it's like that, that's actually something that uh, you'll see guys like doing a quick uh, quick calculation on the back of an envelope or something to figure out what, what to use. 
Um, one of the things that Premier is actually really good at is working at all different types of aspect ratios and raster sizes. And uh, we see that quite a bit uh, in these types of workflows. So really quickly, let me cut back over to my, uh, my screen here. I'm gonna move back over to Premiere. Oh, by the way, this is another little quick Easter egg for you guys. This is the one of the reels of Terminator. This is the actual edit. Uh, I was able to get a screenshot of uh, one of the shots in there. So you can kind of see the complexity of the timeline, the different layering that happens on the timeline. Every version of a visual effect shot, as the visual effect shots come in, they all get layered on top of each other um, inside the timeline so that at any point in the process, if the director wants to go back and say, you know, let's compare, let's do an A-B comparison between this week's shot and the one that we had two weeks ago, they can just toggle the layers on really, really quickly. Okay. What I wanted to show you here is just a quick example of the use of non-standard sizing and aspect ratios when we talk about different types of footage. Um, because we no longer just deal with things like, you know, 1920 by 1080, 3840 by 2160. We're see, seeing uh, cameras that shoot in, you know, extreme aspect ratios, like a two to one aspect ratio, 4K by 2K. We see, um, you know, it, it's like trying to keep all of these different things straight. What is 6K? Is it 6144 by 3126 or is it, eh, it's a bunch of numbers. <laughs> the good news is, once you get your footage processed, um, and in particular, if the footage is wider than you intend on showing, or it's taller than you intend on showing, Premiere is super, super flexible on the dimensions of the timeline that you work with and the dimensions of footage that come in. So really quick, if I jump in here, and let me just bring up my preferences really quick, because there is one set of preferences that you want to make sure are turned off if you're going to use this workflow. So to do what I'm doing right now, I'm actually turning off something called default media scaling. I'm going to leave that off because I want to take advantage of the fact that Premiere will do something called center cutting automatically. So if the footage doesn't match the timeline, we automatically look at a center section of the footage. So as an example, if I take this clip and we load that in the source monitor, you can see that this clip was shot at an extreme aspect ratio. This is almost a two to one aspect ratio. And if I reveal this in my project here, reveal in project, there we go. You can see the resolution of this shot is close to two and a half K, almost 2.6 K by 1080. Um, and I'm not saying that particular aspect ratio is common. The, the key thing here is we're living in the Wild West. There is nothing is necessarily common anymore. We see all different types of shapes, sizes, aspect ratios that you need to work with. And uh, so the key thing here is you can actually create a sequence of any resolution or any size depending on what you're trying to deliver. So in this case, my sequence resolution is actually 1920 by 1080. So I'll go back to my computer for a second. I'll go to my sequence settings. So you can see here, this is 1920 by 1080. A very common format that we see for some editors that are working in a wider screen, they'll actually change this from 1920 by 1080 to 1920 by 858 is one of those magic numbers that we sometimes see. And that more closely mimics a uh, like a 239 aspect ratio or what we call a, a cinemascope. Um, in this case, I'm going to leave it alone. We'll just leave it as it is. But you can see how this actually impacts the framing of the shot. Whenever I bring in a clip, it automatically shows me what is going to be delivered. This is what the end, end customer is going to see. But if I want to re reframe a shot, all I have to do is right click on it, uh, choose, or actually I don't even have to right click, I'm using a, a keyboard shortcut called match frame to load it up in my source monitor. Uh, I can see the entire range that I have. And then using the effect controls, if I want to move this around a little bit, 
I can simply grab the position controls and I know that I'm not going to slide it top or bottom. That would expose black behind it, but I can slide it left or right to change the framing of the shot, depending on the type of look I'm, and feel that I want to do. So gone are the days that you have to edit at a specific aspect ratio or specific resolution. I always ask uh, my clients, you know, what what is the deliverable going to look like? You know, do you want to just have it fit, you know, uh, a 16 by 9 television, 1920 by 1080 is perfectly fine. 3840 by 2160 is fine. Um, but as we start getting into these, you know, we start talking about the cameras that shoot in 4K, 5K, 6K, 8K. They don't have standards for the actual aspect ratio. You, it's on a camera maker by camera maker basis. A red camera considers, you know, 6K is slightly different than the 6K you can get on the Sony Venice, for example. And uh, so that's where we, we start to get into this idea of, again, you know, we are, have entered the magic uh, golden age of fixing almost anything in post using some of these different techniques. Uh, we do see a lot of just fine tuning, tweaking and, and adjusting of footage that you might not think about uh, that falls under the category of post production. Um, Actually, and that, it's funny that you're saying this, Carl, because that just came up, which is, is you know, is that 2.6 to one, like a standard 2.5K? Is, you know, is there a standard yeah. for 6K, 8K and above? And, and you said, and this is something I say all the time, it, it, there really aren't any standards, right? Every camera no. manufacturer has their own special sauce, their own specific thing. And uh, it's our job to just make it work in the timeline, basically. Yeah. If it, even, I mean, even when you go to watch films, this is one of those subtle things that the average film goer probably doesn't notice. But uh, in particular, you may notice the curtains on the film are on the screen. If you get there and you watch the trailers beforehand, those curtains actually move and they yes. change to frame <laughs> right. frame the screen because everybody is shooting on and, and dealing with different aspect ratios. And right. so a lot of them are very similar, but you know, it just creates a different feel to shoot something widescreen, you know, like Tarantino and you know, right. Once Upon a Time in Hollywood or Hateful Eight. You know, which were shot in these these anamorphic, you know, wide formats, right. um, versus Cinema a film scope. like a, yeah. a Ghost Story, uh, which is a great film by David Lowry, also cut and premiere, um, that was all shot in more of a four by three, more of a right. standard what you would call an Academy Academy flat, I believe, is the mm -hmm. official name for that aspect ratio. So, um, if you're a film geek like I am, you know, I have a poster at home that actually has all this stuff talked about. And, uh, you know, there's there's some technology out there that's kind of pushing the envelope with this. There was something that Barco played with a few years ago. Um, you know, our friend Vashi Nitomansky actually cut a film um, in, an, in a three to one aspect ratio shot on red yeah. cameras. So it was 6K across was yeah. the final deliverable. Um, and he and edited was, that natively. He wasn't even using he proxies did. for that workflow, right? It's crazy. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, and, she's uh, a magician. That's all there. He's a wizard. That's all there is to yeah. it. So, so these are all techniques that you guys can use. Um, you know, I'm, I'm glad to be doing this series with you, Jason. It's, it's really awesome to be able to, uh, you know, kind of talk about these types of things because they are, they do get kind of geeky. I hope that's okay for, uh, for your audience here, but, oh, uh, yeah. you know, these are the types of things that I love. So, well, and that's the thing is, you know, uh, and I think everybody, it's something that people can relate to now, especially look, even at, even at the, Let's escape Hollywood for a moment. Even at the social video creator level of kind of video entry, you have to, whether you like it or not, you have to be sort of aware of aspect ratios, right? Because everything from, mm -hmm. you know, Snapchat, Insta Stories, okay, those are those are standard nine by sixteen. But now you've got Facebook video, which is standardizing on what is it four by five? Four by is, five is yeah. their new flavor. What? Four by five. <laughs> you just said four by three was that Hollywood standard or the old pan and scan TV standard. Um, and yes, and then you've got you, you bring in, you know, a mixture of cameras that have completely different, unique aspect ratios. Then you bring in legacy footage. Then you bring in all these other things. I mean, I love that you're able to kind of speak to this one so directly and honestly and then show like that chart like you did to say, look, yeah, this is this is what people are dealing with. I mean, we'd all love Absolutely. to have that to some degree, that one standard, one size fits all, but that just isn't the reality. And, you know, it's, there's a lot of creative problem solving, which you've really beautifully illustrated here that comes into play. We're just kind of making all that stuff work and how to really 
optimize your your NLE, your system when you're cutting and doing your composites to work for you and not against you when you've got all that mixed media. Yeah. And, and Premiere is perfect for this type of stuff because, uh, you know, we don't have to set a resolution when you create a new project. We do it on a timeline by timeline basis. So you can have that ability to kind of experiment. And with new Sensei powered features like Auto Reframe, um, you know, we're seeing that a lot right now. In fact, um, I don't know if you saw the commercials for it, but uh, there's kind of a lot of buzz down here with a lot of the post houses. Um, a lot of time being spent making content for this new uh, mobile first network called Quibi, um, which is launching in April. So, um, you know, I can't talk any specifics, but uh, it's definitely something that uh, we're hearing that word. We're hearing from a lot of customers that are saying, yeah, we're working on Quibi content right now. Yeah. Since, and, the, uh, since the Super Bowl, I have not stopped seeing Quibi commercials ads it's just popping up everywhere. They're yeah, everywhere. Yeah. yeah, it's there's, there's some big names behind it. They're really trying to make sure that people can watch the content both vertically and horizontally, whatever they feel comfortable with in the environment they're in. And uh, they're doing some really interesting stuff. I read an article about how Steven Spielberg's doing a show there that uh, it's called After Dark. You have to watch it after dark. Um, it's actually time locked content so that the sun has to have set for you to see it. <laughs> oh kind of kind of weird interesting stuff there but uh the aspect ratio stuff is is definitely uh um it's one of those areas that uh this is this is our strength you know we can do up to you know something crazy like 10k by 1080 or, or it's 26 megapixels in any direction or some crazy number i always forget what the uh, the actual math on it is and uh you know you can go in and customize your sequence settings to do whatever you need and that really helps and that's, again, that's kind of one of those things that we've, uh, we used to, I remember we used to talk about this on the road, you know, long before there was, I mean, maybe, I don't even know that there was 4K when we started doing that, but, you know, <laughs> long before there were 4, 6, and 8K, at the time, I don't know if we've expanded it, but I remember we could do like a 10K sequence, right? Because we were actually doing that for projection, like projection style uh, videos yeah. and things like that. Projection um, mapping. Or, projection uh, mapping when, and all that, yeah. When, you know, you deal with like our own Max trade show, the Adobe's Max uh, trade show that you're on stage. Um, you know, the screen for that, I don't know what the resolution is. I think I'd have to uh, uh, talk to Serge. I know um, at Adobe could probably tell me, but you know, you're talking about crazy, crazy resolutions that oh. span, you know, across multiple stages. It's it's and massive. It is, it is in the plus 10,000 pixels wide arena. And I know this only because I had to give them some content for those screens and had to be mindful of just my little piece of it that occupied X thousand pixels or whatever. So yeah, it's it's huge. It's absolutely huge. And it's, yeah, and we're doing it all natively. Yeah. Wow. Sweet. All right. Well, everyone, uh, I'm going through all the chats here. I think we uh, I think we got all the questions. Carl, I think you just had a lot of people really mesmerized. We, we kept... We kept thousands of them watching attentively, so uh, this is awesome. Of course, uh, we'll be back each and every Thursday uh, with Carl talking about these high-end workflows. If you want to see more or you have specific questions or you have specific desires that you want to see, things that are, again, kind of, you know, how do you, how do you prep stuff for Netflix? How do you do – I know Carl and I were talking before about, like, exporting. You know, exporting is a thing that people are really – I get a lot of questions about, I show it from different sort of different perspectives, YouTube, Vimeo, social, but maybe Carl, this is something we could do on a future stream, like talking about what does Netflix really want? What do theaters want in terms of DCP exports? I just had a question about that. A lot of questions mm -hmm. about DCP export as of late. Uh, you know, and these are the kind of things that we love showing here. So if you've got questions, you can ping me and Carl. Now, Carl, you're Carl Soule at Twitter. That's right. Yeah, at, at Carl Soule. You at jump Carl on Soule. Twitter. You feel free to ping me there. Yeah. Um, look, look me up on Facebook as well. Um, and I'm also on LinkedIn under Carl Soule as well. Awesome. Okay. So we will be sure to do that. So again, you'll be able to watch the replays on YouTube, on Facebook, on Behance, and on Twitter Periscope. Until next time, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great rest of your morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we will see you again next time. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.